In the constantly changing world of fundability, the big question is this. How are entrepreneurs and real estate investors like us, ones who want to grow our businesses and who are tired of paying for really expensive alternative lending, how do we tap into the most inexpensive money available and do it without the hassle of typical borrowing? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. Welcome to the Get Fundable Podcast with your host, Merrill Chandler. Welcome back, everybody. Merrill Chandler here, your host of the Get Fundable Podcast. And I've got a spectacular guest today. We are leveling up like you have never seen. We're going from small business borrowing into a discussion about commercial level borrowing, and the do's, the don'ts, and how the, how your fundability positively or negatively impacts that, uh, that fundability. So when we get back, we'll dive right in with Mark Dolfini. Welcome, everybody. Merrill Chandler here, your host of the Get Fundable podcast. And have I got a treat for you today? N- no joke. My guest th- uh, this afternoon is Mark Dolfini. And currently, um, he goes, uh, uh, he does a, an amazing job of presenting a, 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 a fascinating model that we're going to go over today about uh, where he coaches landlords. But man, that was that. When we he and I met and we started talking, all that scratches the surface on the depth of not only of of his uh, awareness of what's happening in the commercial lending markets, but how that impacts the the real estate investor, and that's our tribe. So, welcome, Mark. Glad to have you here with me today. It's good to be anywhere. <laughs> I'm not even sure, with 2020. I'm not even sure that the moon isn't going to crack in half and have vultures coming out of the middle no isn't that the truth somebody uh so somebody told me recently about uh they'd read a tweet and it said can you imagine being the history teacher trying to cover 2020 10 years 20 years from now right so uh, uh, it's going to be a semester long course just the year 2020 i I, I think it's going to be like you know freshman year is going to be like you know uh, revolutionary war history, you know, then you're going to go on to like World War II and then like junior and senior year just might be just like 2020. That's about yeah. all you can cover. No, how, yeah, 2020, because that's where the entire world pivoted, both in, in a number, social unrest, uh, uh, which is just it, it, crazy right now, as well as economic unrest, as w- which are complete, they're not even related, right? These two things are not even related this time. And now we're, we, we got COVID with all of these people in the streets. I can't imagine we're not going to have another, another little whipsaw in, in the COVID environment. So in the midst of all of this, we're, some of us are trying to keep our heads about us to, to see how we can positively imp- impact our communities, positively create a, a, a reasonable and deliberate way about us so that we can inspire others to to grow their lives right to improve their lives um, and 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 amidst all the madness let's say yeah. all right so uh, so first of all uh, mark give me to tell my tribe a little bit about your background and how you ended up landing in in, in the uh, landlord coaching space and especially about uh, i'm just going to say right now the uh, this phenomenal book that i was able to read um about which i thought was going to be um about landlording when in fact it was actually highly a transformative highly uh, a awareness raising uh, a book right so please tell us well thanks um so there's it's it's a bit of a long story like most you know most substantial stories you would want to want to hear but um i uh i grew up in new york i joined the marine corps because i wanted to get out and and see the world a little bit and serve my country and I did that. And after, after a couple of years of that, I was thinking that there had to be a better life. Um, and I was right. <laughs> so Marine Corps was very good to me and very good for me, but I wanted to go and do my own things. I was always very entrepreneurial and, um, 
you know, very creative and that doesn't, that just wasn't a good fit for the Marine Corps. Uh, so I left, I went to an the, entrepreneur in the Marine Corps, right? <laughs> <laughs> kind of, there, kind of yeah, the corporal that, clanger of, di- yeah. Di- yeah. Di- diametrically op- opposed. <laughs> right. So I ended up getting, um, now I, 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 it was funny because I, I needed to get out. I needed to, you know, I wanted to get out and get my education and so forth. So I had to take an SAT. Well, I graduated 352nd out of about 354. <laughs> so yes, I graduated the top 98% of my class. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the beautiful thing is, is that, and you were, that you, we all mature or we all, uh, we all excel at different stages in our lives, right? Uh, so I get it. I totally indeed, get it. Indeed. I, I guess the reason I say that though, is because if there are people out there that think, you know, and, and uh, they may have that limiting belief that, you know, if, if I'm not smart enough, you know, he, you know, he's just different. He is, you know, trust me. Yeah. yeah. Get that head yeah. trash put away because I promise you that is not, that is not the case for anybody. Um, so, you know, Probably. if I was able to figure it out, I got a good enough score to somehow get in, accepted to Purdue. Um, went to Purdue. A lot of the time I was there while I was at school, I was starting to look at buying rental properties. Um, so I was working for a bank and I was trying to figure out, you know, how do I, how do I get fundable? Like how, like I didn't have enough money to buy. Right. Well, I had, I had to learn how the banks, how they thought, right. Well, they don't think logically. I can tell you that. And and I think that you know this. (laughs) (laughs) That's why, because algorithms actually are the quintessence of if then, if then, if then, if then, if then else, right. That is, that's not as logical as one might think, right. It's circuitous in a number of ways. So, well, well said. Yeah. And and that's the thing. So I needed to figure out like, well, if I can pay rent, which is a higher dollar amount, wouldn't it make sense that I could qualify for a mortgage? Well, not necessarily. (laughs) So it was very, um, it was very frustrating until I learned, I'm like, oh, well, let me learn about this a little bit. Now, mind you, I'm talking about residential type mortgages, not, not what you do. Um, but that's a little later that I learned how they thought on the commercial side when I was a commercial, um, analyst, but in the, in that space, I was learning about front and back end ratios and learning how they make decisions about borrowing. Well, once I figured that out, then it's just like, let me, let me show them what they need to show, what I need to show them. And I got, I was able to buy, buy properties. So by the time I graduated from Purdue four years later, I had about a half million dollars worth of real estate that I had accumulated, which is about a dozen rental properties. I think it was right around a dozen. Congrats. Um, That's awesome. Congratulations. Right. Well, For, it doesn't, especially being in the 98th percentile of your class, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So if nothing else, I was able to figure out how stuff worked. Um, but, uh, but, you know, so I, as I continued going on and I got out of, uh, I, I worked a couple of different corporate jobs. I, I worked as a corporate accountant for Marriott, wonderful company. I loved working for the Marriott, but just didn't enjoy the work that I was doing. Then I went and sold my soul and worked for an accounting firm for a while, which was horrible. <laughs> but then I worked, I, when I was working at a bank, I was doing commercial underwriting. And I really did enjoy that work, but, but it just didn't pay very well. Banks, ironically, they just don't pay well, <laughs> right? Um, certainly with people with, with my background. So I really enjoyed that, but that's really where I cut my teeth in learning how banks really made decisions, you know, so it wasn't just front end and back end ratio, you know, on the front end, on the, on the residential side. Now it was debt service coverage, you know, things like cross collateralization, things like, you know, things that all of a sudden were just not in the same realm right. as the, as, as the residential side. Yeah. Listen, listen to everything that he has to say guys, because uh, uh, we talk about leveling up, right? We talk about uh, the, the, the live in flip, right? And then we talk about the, f- now we don't have to live in it. We can actually live somewhere else and do the fix and flip. Some of, some of our tribe are already have dozens of properties in in their inventory in their holdings right uh, but the but for those of you who are committed to l- seriously taking on commercial level banks and these are these are the the, the 2 to 5 million dollar loans and 20 and 50 million dollar loans depending on what you're what you're acquiring that's a whole it's fundability a principle still apply you're just now major leagues instead of little league baseball 
So right. what? So so uh, so share more of the exp uh, your experience of when you're at the banks, and and what was it that you discovered um, that what that kind of made you have an aha moment about corporate or or commercial underwriting right what was what were some of the the, the principles that they looked at some of the things that a a, a borrower who is kind of uh, uh, swinging for the fence and has mm -hmm. a good R, uh, 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 an rbi <laughs> but isn't in the in the show yet right isn't actually in the major leagues what what are the things that that my tribe needs to be aware of while they build, uh, let's say they got 50 doors and they're like, oh, and, and so they got some multifamilies, right? And then they, what, and they're looking to go to the next level. What do they need to watch for? What do they need to, to, to be prepared when it comes to that underwriting? Because it's all manual underwriting right. at, at, at that level. There is no automatic underwriting per se. Yeah. So uh, to answer that question, now, to be a little bit fair, the world of banking changed fundamentally back in 2009, right. 10, 11-ish, yeah. right? It just, everything changed because the world was just a different place now. Bank, the banking world was a different place. Um, but I, so I can speak to my experience back then. And I don't think it's changed a whole heck of a lot, but there is more automated underwriting and it occurs at different levels now, depending right. on the bank that you're working at. Okay. So it's, it's one of the reasons why I like working with community banks because I'm not getting an automatic rejection because of, <laughs> you know, like right. it, I didn't fit, you know, there was something that was flagged that it's just easier to reject it and then, and then kick it back to the loan officer. But, <clears throat> you know, we didn't touch anything that was under half a million dollars. So if it was a half a million or better, it went to my desk. Now I did a lot of stuff with real estate, um, uh, real estate manufacturing and some ag. I live in Indiana. So, you know, this <laughs> yeah, kid from I, I New York, all of a sudden there. learning about ag lending. I was like, okay, I can recognize a horse in a photo. Like that's about <laughs> yeah. it. You know? All right. Now, <laughs> you know, um, are we, are we talking uh, acres or hectares, right? Oh, <laughs> right. I had no idea like any of this stuff. So it was really, really interesting though, to, to learn about farming operations and you know, how many, um, how many, uh, you know, um, uh, litters in you, they, they would have in a hog, like how many you could expect and all this in Parvo. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't even know any, what, what any of this stuff meant. All of a sudden I was being really educated. So I had some really, I mean, the people that I learned for were literally like the dream team of commercial lending. These right. guys were really good. I mean, they were just oh. really, really good. So to answer the question, it, it was, you know, like you're saying, what should people look for? I mean, I was already dealing with people that were massively successful. I mean, these were people who were building multi-million dollar developments. They were, they were home builders. They were, um, you know, these were people who were making, who had already made a large impact in, right. in the community and were building, and were building even more. Um, but one of the things that I noticed was that, you know, they, they operated very much like a business, which is something that I talk about in the Time Wealthy Investor 2.0 is it's not about doing this side hustle, it's about operating like a business. I mean, these were companies that they had, they had financial statements, they had balance sheets, they had income right. statements, they, they were prepared by CPAs, they were prepared by professionals and they weren't trying to do it all. They weren't right. trying to be their own lawyer, be their own the you know, mom and CPA. Pop version of this. Exactly, yeah. Even though these people were, they started out the mom and pop, but they recognized the value of a, an experienced person in their corner. Just like, you know, again, if you want to be fundable, get with a banker that knows what you're trying to accomplish. Right. You know, and, 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 and allow them, give them reasons to want to give money to you. Be fundable, be, be lendable, be borrower, yeah. you know, be a desirable borrower. Yeah. And if you can be that, you know, much of what they learn from you, then you've got an advocate who's going to want to loan you money not like, you know, and not want to take it back, you know, um, you know, or call the loan when, uh, when, you know, it would be the worst time. Yeah. So Our, that's what I'm saying. Like, so the fundamental things were, I guess if, if I was to look at an overall fundamental thing is they operated very distinctly like a business. 
So, um, so speaking to that, t tell us about the, the, the VIP model that you have, that, that is, is fluent in your book, right? I mean, start to finish. And, and uh, so that my people know how we get from one to the other, because the end game of this is upping your game in a commercial environment, right? I mean, right. it is it is moving from that half million to that million, to that three million. I have people, uh, my, uh, I uh, boot campers and clients who are always like, yeah, where, what's the next level of borrowing, right? And that's why when I, when I met you for, oh, I forgot the entire intro, my bad. Uh, so you gotta know, first of all, you gotta know where Mark and I uh, met. We met on a on an Enri on the Enria cruise. I've talked about Enria cruise, the the national uh, uh, national Ria national Ria uh, uh, yeah. uh, group. And um, when we were there, we sat down at we were at the same table for dinner, and there was just a it was just electric. It was easy instant to see <laughs> where we each were and how the it would the positive version of collusion i don't know collaboration or otherwise <laughs> and i had also now i had somebody sitting at my table who knew more than i did about commercial lending i i know a lot of things about a, a few things but i don't know everything that's in this man's head and i'm like all right this is a done deal we have to get him on uh, on my show because I wanted you to be able to influence and and basically shine a light on what's possible next, right? Because some people haven't even got their first half a million, but our goal is a million for our clients. Right. So, but uh, but the, but one of the biggest factors that we've run into is that a client will come to me and they'll say, "I'm all in. I'm ready to get my million dollars. I'm going to get the business lines of credit, get everything dialed in," and then they hit two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars. And they stop. And, and I'm like, why aren't you continuing? He said, I can't deploy the capital that I have. They right. can't, they're not, because they're doing everything themselves. They're not leveraging yet. They're not, uh, they're, they have one contractor team, but haven't done the research to have two or three teams at the same time, right? right. So they're in the, the they've got, the, the, they've got uh, the 32 ounces of, of, funding but it's but an eight ounce glass and they just don't know what else to do so that was uh, so so when i when you sent me your book and i would i absolutely loved yeah how you model it so please share with us kind of the uh, the vip model and and how that helps somebody who's in the in the do-it-yourself game Sure. To moving into a higher level of 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 building a team and 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 an empire. Yeah, and well, and here's it's it's ironic because I just got off a, a call prior to prior to this call with a with a guy who's looking to literally take his business like multiplied by about five you know five times. So he's looking at you know he's got a two million dollar business. He's looking to bring that to a like a like a ten to twelve million dollar business. Right over the next two years. And I'm like, dude, that is a completely different business. <laughs> yeah, right. Like right. right now you're probably still doing some of the doing. Right. And he's like, yeah, yeah I try to, I try to, I'm like, dude, <laughs> hold on a second. Just let's hit the time out button here for just a second. Yeah. What do you pay your, you know, your people to do what they do. Right. And he says, well, I, you know, I, I, I pay them $15 an hour. I said, so when you are doing that work, that's what you're paying yourself. Yeah. So, you know, for the listeners out there, or watchers, however you're listening, yeah. you're consuming this, but, you know, you did not, I hope to God, you did not get into real estate to create a 12 or $15 an hour business for yourself. Yeah. If that's the case, you can go out, you didn't need to invest a hundred or $200,000. You could do that tomorrow. We could get into a cleaning business Right now, like before we leave the call, go to Home Depot, buy a bucket and a mop and a couple of sponges and we're in business, right? Yeah. You didn't do that. So that's what I'm saying. There's very low barrier to entry for that. That's why it's priced so low. But when you're, when you really want to get serious about making money, you're not going to sacrifice and say, well, I'll just save the money and do it myself. Granted, sometimes you just have to do it because it's a matter of convenience, right? Rather than call and you just say, okay, I'll spend an hour. I'll clean it up. I'm already here, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Sometimes you just have to. And sometimes I still do that stuff, right? But if you're actively going and planning and plotting to do 12 and $15 an hour 
jobs for yourself, you're never going to make it big. Or if you do, you're going to be so time weary, you're never going to be able to enjoy the fruits of your labor. So that's the whole point is you've got to learn to manage the lines of complexity, right? Like you've got all these things coming at you in different angles, you know, and the way to do that is with a system. Like that's not, that's not craziness. That's why when you see a very busy business, I don't care what business it is, McDonald's, Starbucks, uh, Lo whatever, you know, whatever it is, Lowe's or Menards or wherever you're at. When you are, when you see a system that's running well, you almost don't even notice it. That's, that's the beauty of infrastructure. But the problem is when it's broken or non-existent, that's when you get bad service. That's when you get, you know, that table over there, you know, they, they've got a, they've got two waiters on them and we haven't even been able to give our order yet. Bad infrastructure or bad process. One of the two, right? I'll get into more of that, but you know, when you're looking at the VIP method, which I, what I talked about in the time wealthy investor, um, the, the, it's really all the VIP method is, is about is a system of setting up a business. Okay. I'll, I'll talk about that real fast. So the VIP method is vision, infrastructure, and process. Yeah. Okay. So this is more of a top down approach. So the vision is really about what you are trying to accomplish. And I, I say specifically, what do you mean? Now notice I didn't say what you want to bring your business to. Like a lot of times I'll meet, <laughs> right. I meet these yeah. investors at RIA meetings like and I go, oh, what are you trying to accomplish? And they go, oh, I want 75 rental units. I'm like, oh, okay. So 74 won't do it, <laughs> right? And the, or, you know, 100. It's always, in, like, it's always in increments of like 25. Like, I don't know what that's about. But it always seems to be- I'm the business rounding. Like What's that? <laughs> I'm rounding. Right, yeah. right, yeah. So like, I want a hundred rental units. I'm like, okay, so you want, so 99 wouldn't get you to where you want to go. Right. And they realize like, and I'll do that for a while, like 92, you know, 87, you know, like, but what they're doing is they're confusing the number of rental units for life, the life output that they think that that will buy them. Right. Right. So they think a hundred rental units is going to get me this lifestyle when realistically I could say, okay, so you want a hundred rental units why would you want hundred rental units if 25 could get you the same Think, life output? Get you what you want. Right. Much, much less lines of complexity. And think about it. Like, you know, mo for most people, I would say that you could deliver on a vision. That's what you want out of your life. But the problem is most people don't have a very clear division, a very clear vision defined. Right. And that's been the problem is they say, oh, no, 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 I, I've got a vision board. I know what I want. And I say, okay, well, tell me what you want. What are you trying to get to in the next three years? And when I start challenging it, and I don't challenge it to be a jerk. I challenge it because I, I, I'm truly interested. I want to know. And then it starts to fall apart. And I, and, I, and I do that not to be a jerk about it, but because I really want them to get clarity in their vision. Well, if it's not, if it can't withstand scrutiny, it's not going to withstand the real world, right? No. <laughs> we're we're going to lose every semblance of what that actually means. One of That's my uh, one of my partners told, um, uh, I I'm Mister Tactics guy. I'm the Mister Tactics, and and what I hear you saying was similar to the message that he was telling me, and which is what I enjoyed when I was <laughs> reading uh, your book was that. I spent my whole life in in a tactical maner uh, in a tactical uh, maneuvers rather than strategy. When uh, and he said, Merrill, the only thing that is valuable is uh, for you to do is the only things that you can do that nobody else can do. What? Right. And I'm sitting here doing everything that anybody could do. In fact, I'd even already hired people to do some of those things, like your example. Right. Right. And I was not breathing the rarefied air of only the things that I had the exclusive skill set or mindset to be able to create. And right. my business doubled the second I took your advice, this, what you're t teaching right now and get out of the, the doing part of it and have a clear vision and then, and then invite and let the system, the infrastructure, let the system do the heavy lifting instead of me. And right. that was, that, that, that was, that's an amazing, amazing, uh, 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 came to an amazing awareness that changed everything for me 
and you're and it's like second nature to you and here i had to spend 50 years <laughs> back ending up into this into this very idea well it's it's funny though i even i coach this stuff now i have a coach too i'm not the kind of coach that says oh you need a coach and i'm not i'm not a coach i have a coach i pay a lot of money That's to why. in fact i got a call with him tonight but it, it's really interesting because you know you've you've met me i'm not a big guy right i'm five seven about a buck fifty you know <laughs> um i'm not a big dude so let from a from a perspective now you know i've met your assistant sky right yep guys little she's teeny tiny right like my my, my bride I could teach them a certain self-defense technique, a certain tactic that would probably work well for them because they're small. I'm not a big guy, like I like certain things. Now, if I was going to teach you to do a throw, right? And that's the only tactic, you know, now you're bigger than me. You could probably get, do it a lot better than I could, but that's the only tactic, you know, then it's really, it's not always a one size fits all thing. Right. right. Exactly. Like so many people say, Oh, I could get you into wholesaling. You'll make $30,000 a month. All you got to do is this thing that you hate. Now I'm just using this as an example, but you, all you do is this thing that you hate, but don't worry though. You'll get 30 grand a month. You'll go. Yeah, but I have to feel like I sold my soul to do it every single time. <laughs> it's not yeah. worth it. Right. So, you know, just like I get reached out to like people on Facebook all the time. They'll say, Hey, you'd be great at selling whatever magic potion they want me to sell for them. <laughs> um, yeah, I probably would be good at it, but I don't want to. It's not the, the highest and best use of my time. Right. And that's what a clear vision does for you. A clear vision first. It, it, I, I use the analogy of the most dangerous place on the planet being between a mother and her child. Right. <laughs> That's actually great. Arguably. Yeah. Because fair style, right? Exactly. M Mama's got a very clear vision about watching that child grow up and be safe and everything else, right? C certainly a good mother. Yeah. So when you could when you go after your vision with a ferocity of purpose like that, that's dialed into you, that's just innate, you're not gonna allow distractions to come into your world. You're not gonna allow nonsense and drama and things that are going to distract you from that vision. Right. Correct. It's the analogy that I use to say, you know, Meryl, you and I are going to go on a road trip and drive from Michigan to Florida. Right. Now our vision is to get on the floor, you know, get to Florida, you know, get to Key West, you know, feet yep. in the sand, sit on a lawn chair, drinking, you know, holding a cold drink. Right. Yep. And we're, you know, and our goals along the way are the intermediate waypoints. It's like, okay, we'll hit Indianapolis, then we'll hit Chattanooga, then we'll hit Atlanta, right? It's goals along the way, right? right. So that's, so vision is the ultimate, right? And then the goals are just the milestones along the way, the waypoints. But somewhere between Indianapolis and Chattanooga, you say, you know what? I got a buddy who lives in St. Louis. <laughs> yeah, it'd be so cool to hang out with him. I, last time I saw him was in third grade. I'm sure he's a cool dude. Let's go hang out with him. And I'm going to hit the timeout button again and go, no, that's not in alignment with your vision. Our vision is to get there, right? right? But let's face it, in real estate, how easy is it to get distracted? Uh, it's the next, uh, the bigger, better deal, right? It's the next opportunity that's like, hold it, this may be easier, yeah. that, uh, easier, faster, and, and better than what I'm doing now. And so we literally divert all of our resources yep. to chase what I call in, in my book, the shiny object, right? Yeah. Chase the credit score instead of build a fundable profile. Right. That's exactly right. And, and it was funny cause I, uh, I was, I was thinking about you yesterday because I had, um, I had paid off some credit card debt recently and I didn't have a whole lot, but I was just, as I was paying it down, well, I paid off one credit card in full and literally, so this was probably about a month ago. Yesterday, I got a letter that they were reducing my credit line from six thousand to five hundred dollars. What am I do with five hundred dollars? Like that's like, and it's a rewards card. Like, I what am I, what am I gonna get with that, right? Right. But that's the way they think, and I, and I and I don't try to make logical sense of it. I'm not hurt by it. I'll probably just cancel the card, move on, whatever. But they have their risk things that have nothing to do with because it, it's their retail profile. Right. It doesn't make sense. Right. Yep. But I want to be fundable in, in, in the commercial space, right? So let, let me finish up the VIP method yeah. here because I know there's other things you want to talk about. So once you get your vision clear and you get your vision really super clear about what it is that you're trying to accomplish, I mean you specifically, what's the level of life output that you want, okay? 
then you get your vision clear. Now, I will tell you, it's not easy to do on your own. It's like kind Correct. of like trying to put lotion on your own back. It's you're too close to it. Sometimes it's just you think you're you're good, but I have a you know my coach helps me with my vision and making sure that I'm making decisions in alignment with that. Now, the next piece is infrastructure. Now, the infrastructure is it's not only the bones of your business, but it's also the asset class selection that you make. So, with the asset class selection, that could be: Are you in single family? Are you in multifamily? Are you know? Are you in commercial? mixed use, like, you know, uh, could it be parking garages or, you know, whatever it is, you know, right. storage facilities, whatever you, that asset class selection is, that's the one piece of infrastructure. Now I did not write about that asset class right. selection in, in the time wealthy investor. I, I did not write about that only because it would have taken up, it would have been like a 500 page book and you know, <laughs> no <one would> it. <laughs> well, those, yeah, we call those wealth strategies, right? And, right. The, and every single one of those have an entirely different set of operating procedures and, and well, and, and, and different infrastructures are required for each one of them, right? That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the next piece of the infrastructure, like you talked about is, you know, what software do you need? What, you know, what, um, uh, accounting software should you have, you know, property management software, right. um, you know, if you have a virtual assistant, your phone system, if you have a phone system that looks like this, guess what? You no longer get to complain when someone calls you at 2.30 in the morning. That's <laughs> your <laughs> fault. <laughs> right? Yep. Uh, amen. Yeah. So the reason why infrastructure is the next piece is because once your vision is clear, let's say for, at a very fundamental level that your vision is to lay on the beach rubbing cocoa butter on your belly, right? Because I if can't reach my up, back by myself. <laughs> right, yeah, but no, yeah, you can do your belly, you just can't do your back. <laughs> so you have, you have this vision of laying on the beach rubbing cocoa butter on your belly for two months out of the year. Well, if your infrastructure is set up to return emails and phone calls in a timely manner, that's gonna be a terrible experience for you when you're laying on the beach trying to rub cocoa butter in your belly, right? No one wants to work from the beach. That's right. terrible. Like that's the worst. It's like someone punching birthday cake into your mouth. Like, no, don't, like you want to actually be on the beach, be present. So that's the, that's the infrastructure piece. That's the bones of your business. The last piece is the process. That's the tactical stuff that you learn. So I, you might learn a tactic that you go, man, I really like this tactic, right? Because it's in alignment with your skill set, your, your risk tolerance, you know, your like demeanor, how you want to yeah. work. Yeah. Right. And that process runs on the infrastructure that you built that all stays in alignment with your vision for the future. Excellent. Well, see, I, I, I had learned what my takeaway from, from this reinforced by, by what I'd read in your book was that, um, and it was a huge exclamation point. I mean, what you, you were, and by the way, it's a really easy read guys. Uh, it's not, it's not highly technical. It's, it's, it's conversational. You tell way more stories than I do, which is a great way to write a book. Me, I'm just literally, you know, I, so it was, it was awesome. It was an awesome experience. Um, but I, 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 the, the thing that kept coming back to me where I, well, I, my original failures had been was in the infrastructure piece, right? I was, I was carrying the entire, my entire process on my personal back, right? I, I that if it was going to get, if it's going to be, it's up to me, which yeah. is of course the, the worst possible way to, uh, that's not a business. That's a cult of personality. <laughs> and so, and so I, so my mantra became, became let the system do the heavy lifting so that right. my team and even myself get to be geniuses in solving customized problems for, my, for yeah. my clients and my students. We get to use their genius to weigh in on particular situations, not make them fundable. The system right. makes them fundable. Right. And so in, in, in your business, guys, um, exactly what Mark is saying is, where are you doing the heavy lifting? Where, are, where, where do you, where's your personal presence required to be successful because like like mark said the second you're doing the uh, a job for 15 dollars an hour your the, the value of your contribution to the business is 15 bucks an hour and and i you, now you're talking to somebody who came from that place and hopefully we've got the the we continue to leverage and leverage and leverage Right. Uh, uh, the systems, right? The, 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 the infrastructure and building something that people 
don't need a human being to, to, to make happen, but the human beings are there to make sure right. that they stay on track. Right? Yeah, to, more to that point, if I could just make a quick point, if, you're, if your billable time, let's say you did a deal, or let's just say you're working a job, because many people are out there still working jobs, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you're out there doing a job where you're you know, amortized over the amount of time you spend to work and everything else, you're making somewhere about 50 bucks an hour. <laughs> okay, fine. When you're doing that $12 an hour job, you're costing yourself and your business $38 an hour every single time you're doing it. Right. When my, you know, I had this guy who was a mentor who I really appreciated his, his, um, uh, the way he ran his business. He runs a local, um, uh, a disaster restoration type of business. And I just always appreciated the way that he had had to set up. Um, when he kind of pointed that out to me, I was like, I got no wonder I'm broke, <laughs> right? <'Cause laughs> I'm working for $12 an hour. Yeah, and I'm costing myself, you know, 30 or 40 or $50 an hour. Now, imagine if, you're, if your billing rate was more like 100 or 200 or $300 an hour right. and you're out doing $12 an hour work. Now, I mean, you know, now you're, you're in the broke. hundred, now you're in the multiples, yeah. right? That where it just stops making sense. Now, again, I'm not saying that I'm above that work. I love, I mean, if I had a million dollars in the bank, I would still go out and fix stuff. I love fixing stuff, but there's just some stuff that I just really shouldn't be doing, right? It actually, it actually hurts my business. Oh, so um, not saying that you can't do it, but is it always the highest and best use of your time? One of the, one of the uh, things that you brought up about doing work from the beach, I wanted to share with my team. I've never sh shared this because it just came up for me, but there was a time, it was several years ago, um, I, we'd killed it. And my, I, I told my team, um, we can't afford to be gone for a full week as an entire team. We can't just shut down the doors and leave a, a, a new person that we just hired as the receptionist. I, they'll get back to you next Monday, right? So we decided we took a, a t an entire team, eight of us. We packed up a, a, as as one of our a, as one of our bags. We packed up all of our workstations, monitors, and we flew to Hawaii. And we said to be active inside of uh, to be active in, during United States hours you know, continental hours, we would have to work from five until two. So if everybody is willing to work from five until two, from two until 10 or 11, then we'll take a vacation, right? Well, the, the funny thing was, is that as you pointed out very interestingly, is that the, the, the 10 or 11 turned into midnight and one, the, <laughs> five, the 5 a.m. turned into, because everybody had their own rooms, a workstation. We set this, it was, this was pimp. It was amazing as an idea, right? But then <laughs> the 5 a.m. turned into six and seven and eight. And so we, so, so, the, and the, the only thing we got done was answered emails and kept certain um, uh, 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 weekly appointments. We have certain, we have a client class where you get a weekly appointment. The second those were done, right around two, um, okay. it was back out into the world, right? Surfing lessons. We went as a group, we went skydiving as a group, right? <laughs> so it was a phenomenal experience, except we didn't get to play as much as we would like to have and we right. didn't do we didn't do a 50 percent job for our clients because they were intermeshed right so right. Uh, we have never done that again but i have <laughs> taken them on a four-day weekends or whatever you know to be able to do things but you're you're absolutely right if the the, the focus and dedication if you have a system, now if I would have had a system that allowed for, for people to move through their fundability on their fundability path without all of the, 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 the time and energy needed right. for an advisor, right? right? Right now we're moving to that because of all of the things that I've learned that you're pointing out to, 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 to my tribe is that we're making it so that you don't need another human being to move on the path Right. You just need an advisor to make sure that at a particular pathway or at a, at a uh, crossroads that you at least have all the information you need. Right. That's very right. different than 
be, you know, making every step occur. So right. I've learned a lot of exactly what you're saying, and and your your book reinforces that process of create vision. I have a crystal clear vision, and like you said, having met, uh, having mentors and partners who put bullets <laughs> in it to make sure that it stands that it's, that it stands the it's resilient right it isn't a whim and then right. the infrastructure is what i'm building now so that it can't so that so that my my tribe my clients my students can move forward without having to wait on a uh, one of my team to sign them off or check them off or otherwise right building that infrastructure and go more so my so my people are strategists rather than tacticians right and, and right. let the system be the tactical influence so you wait uh, i just applaud what you're what you're sharing with my with my tribe well thanks and and, and honestly it all of a sudden decisions become much much easier because then you can just simply ask is this is this in alignment with my vision you know, and people who will reach out to me for advice from time to time will even say, you know, like, hey, I've got a question about X, Y, or Z. I've got this opportunity, blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, okay, well, what do you think my question, my first question is going to be? And they'll go, all right, is it in alignment with my vision? And I said, oh, yep, exactly. <laughs> is it? Exactly. Is it? And, and, if, and, and sometimes it needs to, you know, just because it's in alignment with your vision, you know, especially if you've got a partner. You know, is that is that going to be in alignment with with your ultimate vision? Right. right. It's not just because you, you know, especially if you're in a marriage or you know, a, in a relationship, you don't just make decisions that are going to necessarily bring you into a crossroads. Um, yeah. You know, you want to make that as a couple, and you say, okay, this is going to be a fundamental shift. We need to have this conversation. We need to be intentional about it. And if it's yeah. okay, and you can really say, you know what, this is I I, because agree. let's let's face it. You know, when when you were ten years old probably the most important thing in your world was your bicycle. Well, I don't know anymore. Now it's whatever, <laughs> Xbox or whatever. But the most important thing, probably the most life-changing thing was a bicycle, right? right? At least where I grew up in upstate New York. Where I was. Yeah. Now, when you got to 14 and 15, eh, maybe not so much because something changed in your world where you're now able to drive. And maybe, you know, that bicycle never got ridden or even oiled or even forgotten about. And next thing right. you know, you don't even know what happened to it. It probably got sold in a, in a you know, sold off at a, at a you know, art sale. Hard sale. Yeah. So my, my point is that as you get closer to certain things or as we mature, it's okay for your visions to shift, but they should be part, they should be an intentional shift. You, or maybe you get 80% to your vision. You kind of go, you know what? That's not really what I was expecting it to be. You know, that's not really what I was looking for. You know, I was expecting it to be something different, you know? One so, of the, yeah, one of the things that that, that that brings up for me is that one of the questions that I ask in my boot camps is that, uh, uh, so I say, uh, what is your end game, right? What is, what, what's the why of your life? And uh, invariably, they are nebulous. And they and include some version of time and money freedom, mm -hmm. and so I and I do the I, and so there's an exercise that I'll take my clients through where we say, all right, so you've traveled for three years to every place you've ever wanted to travel. You have been on every beach. You have been in every country. You have backpacked in everything. You, so that's done. You have bought everything. You ha own everything. You live in your dream house. Take out all of the reasons we do, all of the things that we say that we want to do. And I say, so you wake up one morning having done all of this. Now what? What are you going to do with your life when you've been everywhere, have everything, because it, the striving and the, the garnering and the gathering is where we spend the vast majority of our time, right? Because, right, right. But after that's done, what do you want to do? And people, it, and it's fascinating to watch what people, they're like, well, I think I'd like to be my, my, my son's, you know, baseball coach. Yeah. And it, awesome and we go through that exercise then i would say so can you be a baseball coach right now right i mean after you've been everywhere and done everything and own everything that you have 
What is, how do you want to spend your time? And that's, that's the message that I'm taking from what you're, you're sharing is your, your vision. Is it in alignment with my vision? Is this new thing in alignment with my vision? But is my vision crystal clear so that I, and written down, not just a vision board, but a, but, but a, a clear view of what I, how I will spend my time once I, once I am there, wherever there is. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that's exactly it. I mean, the, I think we all have this idea of what our, our ideal lifestyle will be. Um, but it's not until we, um, you know, really start to get close to it. And, and, and even a lot of people say, well, I want to own a Ferrari and a house that, you know, curves with the earth and everything else. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. Right. I'm just saying that, you know, understand with given limited funds, if that's the only thing that really matters to you, then fine. But, you know, if you're working 90 hours a week to have that stuff, then really all you're doing is paying for caretakers to watch <laughs> over your stuff, right? I mean, I, I, I say this a lot that uh, having a having a boat is really cool, but having a boat that sits in your driveway is not cool because it, it, you're spending so much time on income generation and not yeah. on, on not on life output. Yeah, my uh, my my whole view is I I rent everything. I re, I rent wave runners, I rent boats, I rent yeah. a pond a, a houseboats. I don't want to own any of that stuff cuz I want to be able to finish my vacation and walk away, right? And especially assets that depreciate. Are you kidding me? That's not my jam. So so I I, I love what so let's sw- switch gears here for just a minute and and c- w- kind of talk about your the you, uh, kind of your insider view, right? Pulling back the curtain on com- on commercial lending because we've talked about our vision. We the, yeah. the, the 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 we've talked about clarifying that vision. We've talked about uh, integrating a a system or a uh, you know the infrastructure that's going to do the heavy lifting, right? The, 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 like you said, the bones, the skeleton of, and then the process. But if that is designed in our end game is to get into bigger projects, right? That half a million or more, three, five, 10, $20 million projects. What, what, what does my tribe need to know? What, what are the things that they are going to need to watch for? And I know that's a very broad question, but yeah, it, I, just broad stroke it if we can. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things where you. Um, I, I had done a a video a long, long time ago on my channel, my YouTube channel, about um, you know having an intentional relationship with your banker, right? Like it's like so many people treat their banker like they're a bad friend. Like <laughs> if every time you like every we all have that friend that always they it's like hey how are you doing? And you're kind of like. Oh God, what are they going to ask for? I ignore you know? their phone call. I, I don't want to talk to them. Right. Yeah. Or they, they send you a Facebook message and they're, and they're trying to get you to buy some sort of thing. And you're like, you know, I never hear from you just to check in on me, like how you're doing. So it's like, that's how we treat our bankers. And then we're super critical when they don't go to bat for us right. at a loan committee meeting or a loan review, you know, where, you know, we're only calling them and we need money. So it was funny. You're the bad friend, right? <laughs> I'm the bad. I'm the bad friend, right? That's exactly. what I'm saying. Like we're treating them like we're the bad friend. So it was funny because I had <clears throat> reached out to. Um, I would reach out to my banker every now and again, just to say, "Hey, how's it going?" Blah blah blah. And I like these small community banks because, for that reason, like they appreciate stuff that's going on in the community. And I talk about a, a community bank. It's generally less than less than a billion in assets. I mean, that's probably starting to get to a little bit bigger bank. Um, you know, but, but I like the smaller banks because now they have the ability to provide a lot of the same services, the online banking stuff that most of the bigger banks would tout and say, we've got online banking. Well, a lot of the community banks do as, do as well. But you're talking with the individual, you're generally talking with the guy or the gal that's going to be making the loan decision, right? right? right. So I would say, you know, start, having that conversation with the commercial lender, you know, that's in there and someone that you can generally connect with. There's just going to be people that just, they're just not, you're not going to connect with. Right. But right. find someone that you can connect with, find someone, maybe, you know, talk to other people, you know, in your community who are, who have a relationship with a commercial banker and, st- and, and have that conversation say, Hey, look, 
I'm, I'm, I'm new in real estate investing. I'm going to be looking to do some borrowing down the road. You know, what, what, do you, what kind of things do you guys run into? You know, are you trying to grow your bank? I don't know any bank that's not trying to grow their deposits. Correct. You know, you can start bringing your deposit relationship over there. You can start, you know, re referring friends there. If they think that you're a friend of the bank, they're very likely when you do come, start coming to the table to ask for some money. It's just, it's now they're doing a relation. Now it's a relationship right. that they're nurturing. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I would say there's, there's lots to know. There's, there's just start getting smart on some of this, some of their vernacular. You know, I, we can't even scratch the surface on this stuff. But when I start talking about cross collateralization and, you know, they say, yeah, we're going to cross collateralize this with your house and you don't know what that means, you can ask them. I mean, they're not going to know, you know, I don't expect anybody here to understand what a hypothecation agreement is unless you've been, unless you've been involved in one. But right. my point is there's just basic stuff like how they, how they calculate loan, the interest rate, Right. Right. Generally, it's almost always they used to in, back in my day they called it the CMTI, basically the Treasury Index, right? Now they call it the CMT, and sometimes they call it different stuff. But generally, they're going to price it at 300 to 350 basis points above the three, five, or seven, sometimes ten-year CMTI, right? right? Well, if you add that up right now, what's the CMTI like? 0. 0.6, right? <laughs> you know. Nothing. Yeah. yeah, back in my day, when I was in commercial lending, it was usually around three, three and a half percent. So you'd be looking at loans somewhere between six to seven percent. Well, you know, you got to understand that, you know, most of the types of loans that they're going to be getting are not going to be 30 year amortizing. They're going to be 20 to 25 year amortizing and they're going to have roughly a five year commitment on them. Right. right. And renew at that five years. Right. Again, for another, you know, 20 year amortized amortize. over 20, but another yeah, 20 five year, year amortization, uh, another five year re re review. Exactly. So that's why I'm saying like things like that, you shouldn't go in there with th thinking you're, because if you're calculating your deal based on a 30 year amortization, which is longer, longer, you know, longer term, but smaller, sh smaller payments, smaller payment, you know, you, you might, if it's a thin deal to begin with, and all of a sudden you sit down at the closing table and you're like, Oh man, the payments are a lot more than I was expecting. You know, what's the interest rate? Well, you're, lo you're asking the wrong question. The interest right. rate's fine. It's, it's the amortization. The amortization is different. Right? See, and what's, what's fascinating about this, so our, our objective as, a, as a, a, a fundable tribe is to become professional borrowers, right? right? Not rookies, not consumers, but professional borrowers. And our entire, our entire my, my entire model that I teach is relationship building, right? Reconcile bad banking relationships by doing the right things and then build new banking relationships. So you and I speak the exact same language. Um, right. and, and that, but, but what, what I hear, uh, what I hear you saying that I want to point out to, to my crew is that you guys need to be aware that business banking relationships start before the money is being uh, requested. Yeah, we we have in the smaller realms or under a million where we teach how to actually put traffic into your accounts so you can trigger the automatic underwriting guidelines so that you can look like somebody worth uh, worth them paying attention to. Right. That's the, the flowers and the chocolate that we're taking to uh, to, to our you know, to, to our date's door. Yeah. And, and then how they respond is based, uh, and then we start this courtship and, and, and begin building a relationship um, with them that could last a lifetime. The best ones that I have, have I've got 20 years on, on some of my banking relationships right. and we follow bankers wherever they go. So if I'm at Chase yep. or like a community bank and they moved somewhere else, yep. follow that banker, keep your current relationship, nurture that one and, and begin to expand. So those are, those are, those are very key uh, ingredients that you're, that you're mentioning about building those relationships, Mark. Oh, absolutely. You can't, you, I mean, real estate is a contact sport, you know, you, you're not <laughs> going to do it in a box, you know, I mean, all they want, I mean, even, I mean, just sometimes if you reach out, you know, I hear some of these people, you know, complaining because like, Oh, I didn't get a PPP loan and this and that. I'm like, well, did you have a conversation with your banker before you needed it? Oh, well, no. Well, well, what are they expecting? Everybody else all of a sudden wants to be this guy's best friend. You know? Yeah, this, is, yeah, this isn't, uh, this isn't um, 
Oh, I forgot the dating app where you swipe right, oh. right or swipe, <laughs> right. swipe Tinder. left. Yeah, right. Yeah, Tinder. This isn't Tinder for banks, right. guys. Yeah. <laughs> this is not, this is, yeah, this is relationship building. Um, so uh, one last, uh, one last thing. First of all, I, I'm thrilled that you're uh, that you're coming to the boot camp. I, I can't wait to get to have another conversation afterwards yeah. because you get to kind of get, get the, uh, the the fill in some of the blanks of our of our model. And I'm sure we're going to do uh, we'll do this again uh, yeah. based on a deeper dive because once I because uh, I need to dust off some of my old uh, uh, commercial tomes in order to be able to <laughs> ask intelligent questions. Cause I don't want to waste your time, but I, I, it, it's been a pleasure having you, uh, having you here. I please send me a book. I need another copy of the book. Sure. Because I want, uh, I want uh, my partner to have that as well. Absolutely. So please send me another copy of that. And uh, will you please tell us where we can get a hold of you? Yeah, probably the best way, honestly, I'm, a, I'm kind of a social media, you know, scoundrel. I, I, if you want to reach out to me uh, through Facebook, I'm on Instagram. Um, you, you could always reach out to me directly. My email is mark at landlordcoach.com. I give everybody a free strategy session. Um, a lot of times it turns into more than that. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a, I, I, I don't like being, feel like I'm being sold on something. Right. Like, so this isn't like an hour long sales pitch. I promise you, I'm going to give you actionable stuff. I just like to really, truly like to help people. Um, if it makes sense to go on with a longer relationship and coaching relationship, we can talk about that. But um, I don't like to be sold and I don't yeah. like to sell. So I promise you, if you want to reach out to me at marketlandlordcoach.com. If, if there's something to collaborate on, then yep. that's because that's you and I, once again, that's part of where, where, where the, the, the kinetic energy yeah. derives is that um, it's, it's about collaboration. And if there's yeah. something to collaborate on, psh, let's do it. If there's not Godspeed, God bless, right? Exactly. Do, yeah. Do your thing. So, so uh, that's marketlandlordcoach.com marketlandlordcoach.com and social media landlord coach. Thank you for being here for, for kind of, uh, uh, playing, uh, playing in my sandbox, man. Love having you. <laughs> I love having you come over and, and, uh, and be here and coach my team, my, my, my crew. I want all of them to have a, to know more than I know. And so I bring in all the people who know more than I know so that they can enrich their lives on, on their quest to their, to, to their why, right? To their, to their yeah. end game. So thank you very much. It Any, was my pleasure. Thanks so much, Mer. I appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. You be well and take care. Yep. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Get Fundable podcast. Please leave comments because Meryl would love to read about your aha moments from this episode. And be sure to visit GetFundable.com to read our blog, get important links, join our community, and much, much more, like ordering Meryl's tell-all book that is changing the world, the new F word. And you got to tell your friends about this podcast because we want them to get fundable too.